Welcome to the second annual William Sarion Public Speaking Competition. Now, obviously, the competition looks a lot different this year. We would have loved in all our power to do the competition in front of you in the amphitheater. Yet, due to the pandemic, that obviously can't be. Now, with that being said, our 12 finalists are absolutely inspired in order to give you this competition. So join us as we take a look into the competition this year. And I hope that after we're done and after everything's said through, you're inspired to speak in public. Good evening. On behalf of L'Ecole Armenia Surpago, we would like to welcome you to the second annual William Sarion Public Speaking Competition on YouTube. Tonight, you will see the culmination of the persuasive speaking project that the secondary fives have been presenting in class. On top of that, we are going to take advantage of this great opportunity to showcase some of the talented students from secondary one to four as they present to you some of the projects taking place in English class. Obviously, the public speaking competition looks a lot different this year. Despite that, we aim to bring you the same quality of speeches that we had last year. With that being said, this is how the competition will take place. During class, each secondary five student presented their speech on a topic that inspires them and society. Each class had the opportunity to pick a classmate to represent them in the competition. This year, the field was surprisingly motivated and two additional spots were added in the finals. With the restrictions faced by the organizers due to COVID-19, we could not have judges in place to watch the 12 speeches. So the responsibility of choosing this year's winners will fall on the students of secondary four. This competition was taped on April 1st, 2021. To respect sanitary measures, each finalist entered the library one at a time to film their speech. To ensure that this competition was as fair as possible, the speaker was given one shot to deliver their speech and no do-overs. Now that we have explained how this special edition of the public speaking competition works, let's get started with our first speech. The next speaker is Nanor Piribosyan from Secondary 5A with the topic of education system. Hi, I'm Nanor Piribosyan and I'm one of the contestants at the second annual William Sarion public speaking competition. I'm very excited to be part of this year's competition and we have many fierce competitors as well. My subject is how the school system is dysfunctional how it is affecting students' mental health today and what we can do to make it better for everybody's future. So good luck to everybody. Albert Einstein once said, everybody is genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will think its whole life that it's stupid. Einstein with this quote, wanted to bring to light one of the biggest issues in society, which is deeming that giving the same test to each student is fair. When I was in primary school, I enjoyed school. Uh, we were encouraged to be creative. We had less homework, less stress. As I grew up, as I went into high school, I realized that the system was very strictly structured and we had to follow a curriculum and we had so much homework to do that we, were any, we didn't even have time to sleep. That is when I realized that the education system is in fact dysfunctional. It has many flaws and that these flaws can sometimes affect one's mental health and one's life balance. Everyone works at a different pace. There is no one model fits all in teaching or in studying. And one of the biggest issues of the system is we put students in a situation where they have to work equally without taking into consideration their strengths and their weaknesses. That is why the grading system is as well as 
standardized because everything is equal. This can increase one's stress, it can enlarge their workload. And so when I think about it, I question it each day. I'm like, what am I learning? I'm coming to school and what am I actually learning? The term school is like prison isn't said to enraged personnel. It is said because us as students, we resonate with that statement. It is said because as we go along, as we grow up, we lose our individuality and we are taught topics of less interest, meaning that this can result in a reduced motivation, lower grades, which can then decrease the class average and affect the chances of a student getting into their college of choice. There is a lack of creativity in schools. We have to emphasize on non-traditional careers. We keep emphasizing on careers such as law, medicine, engineering, which not everybody wants to do. This is why I propose three solutions. The first solution is to teach math through finance. This way, students will learn budgeting tactics, they will learn skills with money, they will learn how to manage their money. Money is at the base of society. It is what we use to survive. And not knowing how to handle it properly is a big problem. Another solution is to not separate core courses from courses that we deem pa pastime, such as art. Academic courses such as math, English, French, and art should not be separated because they need each other to survive in the school system. One needs the other because they create balance. Another solution I propose is self-care and life skills. How can you go to the world? How can you go into society and not know how to do basic skills such as cooking, such as self-defense, such as sometimes even cleaning your house? What if you, what if your car breaks down in the middle of the road and you don't know who to call? You don't know what to do. Schools should teach that. We spend more time in schools than our own homes on a yearly basis. Should we expect some kind of support, something that is going to help us in the real world? This is why if we do not improve these, we will face challenges. Students that are graduating will have stress and anxiety like we've never seen before. If we do improve these, we will reflect Finland's system. Finland is number one in the world in education because they encourage their students individuality and they help them with their challenges. North America may reflect that someday. What I ask of you is I want you to wake up, look around you. I want you to demand a change. I want you to do whatever you can to change, to make our school system better for everybody. Because if you don't care, who else is going to care? As for me, I would start small. For example, I would go to Miss Lori, I would propose to install clubs because clubs promote self-expression, they improve communication skills, etc. So now that I think about it, I very well know that the education system is standardized, it is dysfunctional, and that schools aren't teaching us, they aren't preparing us for life enough as much as they have to. And so I think about it. Am I going to use budgeting skills or algebra in 10 years? Which one will have a bigger impact on my life in the near future? Thank you. The following speaker is Mila Jevahirjan from Secondary 5B with the topic of education and mental health. My name is Mila Jevahirjan and the subject that I've chosen is mental health and why I think it should be talked about more in schools. I think this topic is very important because I hope that it'll inspire the school to look into this subject. And um, I'm very excited for this public speaking competition because I, I know that raising awareness for the subject is pretty important, but I'm also nervous. In schools, we learn to read and write. We learn math, science, history, and literature. But we don't learn a lot about us, our emotions, thoughts, or behaviors. According to the World Health Organization, one in five teens ages 12 to 18 suffer from at least one mental health illness, and approximately 60% of those students fail to graduate high school. 
Today, I'll be talking about the lack of awareness for mental health on behalf of the education system and why I think it needs changing as soon as possible. For most, mental health is a pretty broad term, but to put it simply, it's a person's condition with regards to their emotional and psychological well-being. A few examples of well-known mental health disorders are anxiety, depression, and body dysmorphia. This is a very important and relevant topic for students and young members of our community because it is during adolescence that all of this develops and eventually could lead to bigger issues. The reason I chose this topic is because I have had experience and struggles with my mental health in the past and it's something that I'm very passionate about. I think that if I had learned about it a bit more in school, I would have made better choices from a younger age. To be more specific, I'll be talking about why high school is the right time to learn about this, how I think the students could benefit from it, and how I think this school in particular could benefit from this topic. I think that schools need to talk about this topic by having a special class dedicated to educating students on what unhealthy behavior is and how and where to reach out for help. Schools are where students spend most of their days. It's where they form connections and build relationships. It's also where they create a sense of self-worth due to school achievements, popularity, grades, etc. Schools aren't responsible, not responsible. Schools are not the problem and neither are the teachers. The problem at hand is that children who go to schools don't get information about this topic unless they ask for it. And that needs changing. As I said earlier, 20% of students suffer from this, these issues and could benefit from learning about it from a trustworthy and safe environment, such as a school. These problems start happening in high school and eventually could lead to bigger issues. So why not cut the problem at the source? Like I said earlier, I have had struggles with my mental health, such as anxiety, and I was lucky enough to have a parent that I trust to talk to, because at first I didn't even realize that it was an issue. And once I did, I had the benefit of being able to talk to someone. But this isn't the case for most, because most people are too scared to go talk to a teacher, parent, etc., because they're afraid of being judged. And this comes from the subconscious shame that society has put on this topic by treating it like a secret. But ignoring it is not going to make it better. In fact, it's already getting worse due to social media, the, un the unfair new beauty standards, and COVID-19. Speaking of the pandemic, the lack of normalcy and socialization could take a toll on literally anyone's mental health, but especially the mental health of a young developing mind. Stress and anxiety are problems that actually sprout from the pressures of school. Uh, this could affect your work, such as reduced productivity, mood irritability, and laziness. In schools, we learn a lot about physical and nutritional health. I feel like I've been hearing those subjects since I'm in primary school, but we never are really taught about mental health, which is really bad because I believe that mental health and physical health are equally impo important components to overall health. Without learning the topic of mental health, children will understand the impact of their words. They won't understand the impact of bullying, fat shaming, slut shaming, and spreading rumors. They also won't understand the importance of kindness, care, and empathy that we have to show for others. Most won't even understand how to show empathy and care. Being in the Armenian community, this subject is even bigger taboo because of the traditional mindset that needing help and asking for it is a sign of weakness. This could cause even more inner conflict and guilt in the minds of the teenagers at our school, which is why our school should look into making it part of the curriculum. By bringing the subject of mental health into our schools, it will help remove the stigma surrounding mental health. It could also help decrease teen suicide rates and make children feel less abnormal and ashamed of their problems. In conclusion, I think that mental health should be part of the curriculum because it would benefit a lot of people and it would help the students at this school and other schools lead a happier and healthier life. Thank you. The public speaking competition has been dedicated to William Sarayan to explain the importance of his contribution to our culture with the help of their teacher, Ms. Lara Naim. Here are the students from secondary two, Sevan Ajemian, Alin Berberian, Lea Donabedian, and Manuel Tasakian, who will show you exactly who William Sarayan is. William Sarayan was born on August 31st, 1908 and died May 18, 1981. He was born in California, was put into an orphanage at four years old, and then went back to his family after. His parents were Armenak and Takoy Saruan, Armenian immigrants from Belize, Ottoman Empire. He went to school until 15 years old, then decided to become a writer, inspired by his dad. A lot of his work was about his childhood. 
Saroyan officially chose to be a writer after his mother showed him some of his father's writings. A few of his early short articles, most of which appeared in the late 1930s, were published in Overland Monthly. He always enjoyed writing short stories and continued to. Word spread and soon enough, his stories appeared in many magazines such as Harper's, The Yale Review, and Scribner's. The Time of Your Life and My Name is Aram were two of his best-selling novels. William had now become known and respected in the literary world. After living in a community that managed to escape the tragedies of 1915, many of his books revolved around the Armenian Genocide. In 1939, he pursued his career in playwright and found great success. The awards he won and the articles written about him contributed to his fame. In 1940, he won two prizes for his drama, The Time of Your Life. The New York Times, one of the world's greatest newspapers, described him as an orphan hurt by a sense of rejection, craving love and bursting with talent. And Time magazine said that the ease and charm of many of his stories will continue to inspire young writers. It is a legacy beyond criticism. After many years of devotion and hard work, William Saroyan became someone whose name is mentioned among such great American writers. Today, it's been more than 40 years since he left this earth, and no one will ever be able to fill his shoes in the literary world. When most people hear Saroyan's name, one of the first things that comes to their mind is his most famous quote from a short story, The Armenian and the Armenian that refers to the genocide. I should like to see any power of the world destroy this race this small tribe of unimportant people whose wars have all been fought and lost, whose structures have crumbled, literature is unread, music is unheard, and prayers are no more answered. Go ahead, destroy Armenia. See if you can do it. Send them into the desert without bread or water. Burn their homes and churches. Then see if they will not laugh, sing, and pray again. For when two of them meet anywhere in the world, See if they will not create a new Armenia. Our next speaker is Aina Zobikian from Secondary 5A with the topic of sexism. Hi, my name is Lina Sovikan, and I'm going to be participating in the public speaking competition. My topic is about sexism, and I'm really passionate about it. Me as a woman, I have a role in society to inform everyone about this everyday issue, and I have to um, tell everyone the consequences. I'm really honored to be in the competition because it's something big for me, and I wish good luck to everyone else. How many of you guys have heard the name Blake Lively before? She is famous for being in several TV shows and movies such as Gossip Girl, for instance. Since she is a celebrity, she has gone through many situations where she had to stand up for herself. For example, back in April 2017, when she attended the Power of Women New York luncheon, she was asked about her go-to power outfit. Blake responded that it was not the place for that type of question when she was actually there to be congratulated for her work with the Child Rescue Coalition. In other words, people would rather know what designer she is representing that day rather than her own accomplishments. The subject of sexism is very fragile to talk about. Some people believe that there is no such thing present in society, but others might think the complete opposite. We as humans have the privilege of living on this planet with others who are completely different from us. So it is our responsibility to respect and accept everyone so that they feel safe in this environment. But there's obviously going to be a group of people who don't think this is right and they're gonna make excuses for it. And this can create a big conflict between these two genders which can lead to them not wanting to talk to one another. I obviously know some of you have heard many stories about how women and men are treated differently. For example, when I was planning my future, I thought about doing something in the engineering field. But then I remember someone telling me that the job is usually for men. Also, apparently the salary is more lower for women than men. So I don't think I'm going to aim for that because the thought of being treated differently is always on my mind. Um, What I want to prove is that sexism is still an everyday issue and uh, we should fix it immediately before it gets worse like the old times.
Um, with present conditions, women face sexism very often. They are generally called mentally weak and sensitive, which are completely not true at all. These assumptions don't identify every woman in this world since everyone is different, like I said. Um, they are sexualized in different types of ways, such as getting judged because of their clothing, their character, or their physical appearance, which can be done when walking down the street. In addition, some people believe that women shouldn't have a job themselves because they they think their place is at home and their task is only to take care of the kids. Um, Malala's story is a great example of sexism in the present time. She was just a teenager when she started realizing that going to school must be a right for her and her and the girls in Pakistan. But unfortunately, only men were allowed to go to school and then continue their studies afterwards in universities. There is this other story where a girl was tying her shoe and she was bent over. So when a man saw her like that from his car, he yelled that he liked that very much. She was 14 at the time, so imagine how scared she must have felt. The solution to all of this is social media. Social media is a great way to spread awareness because it's an app to um it's an app that attracts everyone's attention and it can um it can educate everyone on um experiences of women's life in general and um it can make them feel safer and we can succeed in making everyone believe that sexism is still an everyday issue and in every country it has its existence also we shouldn't judge a book by its cover as they say because even if a woman is wearing certain, like revealing clothes, it does not mean that she wants to perform any sexual activity. And she might not be whatever others think she is. A movement that helps women talk about their experiences in the past is uh, the Me Too movement. It's a social movement that um, helps women realize that it's important to talk about um, what happened to them in the past so that their feelings don't confuse them even more. Uh, like I said, there's going to be people who are going to make excuses for it and they're going to say, oh, wearing revealing clothes means giving consent to do something that the woman doesn't want to, but that's wrong. Um, and we should fix that immediately, like I said. And, uh, imagine if it was your loved one surviving an experience like this and it can very, it can be harmful on your mental health and it can change the whole point of view of guys in general. So the positive side of the solution is that if we abolish it, um, the world would be more at peace. Women would feel safer to go out at night and they wouldn't get scared if someone got angry at them or yell at them or stared at them in a weird way. If this solution isn't carried out, imagine how, um, imagine how scared some of us would feel to walk alone at night. The number of sexual harassment would increase and people would tolerate it even more since in society. My goal is to save as many women as possible in order to keep them away from these traumatic experiences, which can ruin their mental health in the future. But I would also like to mention that not only women are the victims, but there's also men who are the victims. They can face the same traumas and they can have the same problems. But the victim has two choices at the end. Let their let their experience take over their whole life thinking about it every day or speak up about it and have more strength in the future to feel stronger. Our following speaker is Johnny Garboyan from Secondary 5B and his topic is 3D printing. Hello, my name is Johnny Garboyan. My subject is 3D printing. Uh, I chose this subject because I've I've been in the 3D printing field for some years now, and I understand that it's uh, growing and its impact is growing on society. I'm very happy to be a part of this competition because I love public speaking, and uh, if I can win a prize for it, then uh, why not? Uh, hello, uh, my name is Johnny Garboyan, and uh, the subject I chose is 3D printing. Now, I know that you're looking at me and I, you're wondering, why did I choose this subject? What's interesting about it? Well, see, 3D printing is not just a small hobby or, or a, a, 
way to express of your yourself and whatnot. It's actually a very big contributor to society. Uh, let me explain. So 3D printing ha like has a lot of fingers in a lot of pies, as we say. So it occupies three main sections uh, that are important to society. Uh, the first one is the housing industry or real estate. Uh, the second one is the medical industry. And the third one is the robotics industry. Now, let me just clarify that 3D printing isn't just uh, a box uh, where we, that prints plastic and whatnot. It's, it, it's advanced so much that they've replaced uh, the, the filament or, or the, the material that they use and the size of the, the, the machines. So, yeah, this is basically going to lead to us talking about the housing industry. So there was quite recently a big project in Latin America that consisted of building a whole village out of 3D printed houses. Now, how they did this is they basically, as I said, uh, replaced the filament in the machine with concrete or cement. And don't get me wrong, it's not a box as we see regularly. The machine is about half the size of this room. So, yeah. And they built the whole village in 50 days. Now, moving on to the medical industry. Um, it's mainly important to mention that 3D printing is present in the dentistry. In dentistry, uh, that it helps to make uh, uh, dentures for patients and doctors and whatnot. Um, it also makes tools and uh, prosthetic uh, uh, body parts, arms, legs, etc. Uh, for uh, the patients. Now, for the robotics industry, uh, 3D printing is there uh, for the robotics parts. So it makes the robot parts, the, the uh, may maybe the mechanics and whatnot. Um, and it it's three reasons why they use 3D printing to, to make the, the materials, to make the, the parts. And the, the reasons are that 3D printing, the material is lighter, cheaper, and it's more efficient. So basically, by using 3D printing to uh, make the robots, we're really ge getting the technology that we're making is more efficient because of the material that we're using. Now, why am I telling you this? Why am I explaining 3D printing to you? Well, it's because I want to show you that 3D printing is not just a small hobby or, or it's not just a small thing. While the industry has just begun to develop, it's a huge contributor to society. Like, for example, the second aspect of 3D printing is actually that 3D printing could reduce pollution. Let's say we uh, think of how much pollution building one building causes. So think of all the machinery, the trucks, the cranes, the tools, the, the manual labor we use to, to build a building. However, when they built the whole village in Latin America, they used one type of material, one machine, and so little manual labor. And they built a whole village, 50 houses in two and a half months. Also, what if we replace the regular, the, the products that we use regularly, like toys and tools with 3D printed materials? These products are currently made in factories that pollute regularly using women, children, and men uh, to produce the products. And if we replace this with 3D printers, well, the factory stops polluting 100% and your manual labor is more secure. And the women and children who risk their lives sometimes going working in these factories are now safer. Now, again, this is why 3D printing is inspiring. Not, not, not because it brings out the creativity in someone or it's a form of art. No, it's inspiring because it's an image of our ancestors, of, of the generations that came before us. It's an image of their hard work, 
their determination and their effort that they put to expand technology for us to live in a better world. And not only is it an image of our of the generations before us, but it opens a new door to us for us to make our own image for our children and our grandchildren so that they can have a foundation to build their futures on. It permits us to create a future for ourselves and for our society and for our planet where we are the leaders of our bright outcomes, I guess. 3D printing is inspiring for this reason, because it gives us an opportunity to make the, make f- the future for us better, f- for us and for our children. And I see our school today, I see our society, our planet, our world, and I see the faces of our future, and I am reassured that we are in good hands. And I am certain that we will reach our goals no matter what and if we take and if we use 3d printing as a path to avoid certain obstacles that are in our way we could definitely reach our goals and i'm certain that with the people that are around me today we will succeed thank you The logo for the competition was a collaborative task done by our secondary one classes. The final logo was created by Arenjuka Kelyan, Emma Keleshian, and Christel Kochkarian. Along with the help from Mary Kalabalian and Kiona Daisy Melo, they were able to represent this competition well. We would also like to thank Mrs. Natalie Burkulian for her assistance in this video. Now let's hear from our secondary ones. Hello, my name is Aren. I'm Christel. And I'm Emma. And we are the group that created the logo for this year's William Sarian Public Speaking Competition. The logo is created with William Sarian's initials W and S. They are written in the fountain pen font and they are colored in red, blue, and orange. Beside it, there's a pen that is writing, which shows his love and ethnicity for writing. He was born in Fresno. A few of his notable works are My Heart in the Highlands, My Name is Aram, and The Human Comedy. He is an Armenian author who has written many books, short stories, playwrights, and poems. He's won many awards such as an Academy Award. The colors and logo represent his ethnicity as well as the Armenian flag. The red represents the blood that our community has shed throughout the years. The blue represents the Armenian sky and the orange represents the courage of our country. The following speaker is Gabriela Gulian from Secondary 5A with the topic of healthcare. Hello, my name is Gabriela Gulian, and my topic is about free healthcare and how it should be accessible to everyone. This topic is very important to me because the healthcare system is viewed as a privilege rather than a necessity provided to everyone. I'm very stressed about the competition, but I wish good luck to everyone who's competing. Thank you. A 2009 study conducted by researchers at Harvard Medical School found that 45,000 Americans die each year because they cannot afford to pay for any health insurance coverage in the U.S. Many countries do not have the opportunity nor possibility to provide their population with free health care, which results into many societal problems to occur, such as poverty and death. These problems could be easily avoided if dealt with the situation properly. I was once in the U.S. and had a medical emergency and immediately wanted to go to the ER. Many people there suggested I go see a pharmacist first since it would be more cost efficient. I was shocked how their financial situation dictated whether or not they're going to get help. I immediately knew that the healthcare system was in need for change. Healthcare should be free in every country since it's a fundamental right for every human. The wealthy should not be prioritized over the poor and it would lead to less inequality in our society in the future. The healthcare system is generally viewed as a privilege rather than a necessity provided to everyone. It should be easily accessible to all. A person should not be given the choice to stay alive or to die because they can't afford to pay for the resources to help them. Lack of health insurance and therefore access to quality help contributes to higher mortality rates. A doctor once stated on inequality.org, that if rich people had to wait in line for an MRI like everyone else, the American healthcare system would be changed overnight. 
This doctor is literally saying how the wealthy are in fact advantaged over the poor, and they help the government gain profits from the people dying. Another fun fact is that half of healthcare spending goes roughly to about 5% of the population. Each year, medical institutions and hospitals spend millions of millions of dollars on their equipment and staff, but only 5% of the population actually benefits from that. In simpler terms, only 5% of the population can afford to go see a doctor annually or can afford to go through these treatments to stay alive. Even though we live in Canada, we, where we are fortunate to have these services at ease, we have family and friends who live in countries who don't. We should think of them for a change, especially during this pandemic where most of us have to get tested for COVID. Hoping most people will take action and demand awareness, we could utilize media outlets, such as social media, which is right at our fingertips, to try to gain people's attention. By doing so, we can eventually reach the press and see the change we once demanded for. If this backfires, people will think that money matters more than human lives, and that's disgusting. If this solution does work, we will have a promising future ahead of us. We will see change in economical, polit political, and socially related issues. I want people to urge to take action. I want people to know what's wrong with this system. Is it so hard to ask for something that's a necessity to all? Is it so hard to ask to stay alive when there's resources there to help us? Thank you. The next speaker is Arkina Magarian from Secondary 5B, and her topic is social media. Hi, my name is Arkina Magarian, and I'm Secondary 5 student. I'm one of the students who's going to participate to the public speaking competition. My subject is about the impact of social media on us. I chose this subject because it's something that goes on every single day with each of us. It's something that is really important to notice and be careful about it. Competing in this competition, it really makes me happy because not only I have talked about this subject to my classmates, but also I will have the chance to talk about it to everybody. Do you ever think about how much time of your day you have wasted on social media? Most of us have some issues of knowing how to limit the amount of time they sp we spend on it. Today, I would like to talk to you guys about how people, mostly our age, spend a lot of time on social media without realizing it, how it influences their surroundings, and how they can limit their time being on it. The problem is that people who spend a lot of time on social media, they are, they are not spending time with their families, and especially teenagers. For example, when we go home, the first thing that we do is locking ourselves in our bedroom and going on social media. But at the end of the day, we will not have a lot of time to study. When we are done being on social media and there's nothing else to do, we study a little, which is why we will not be able to do other activities and talk with our family who has been waiting all day to see and to talk to us. Even when teenagers go out with their friends or with their family, instead of talking to them, they would be on their cell phones the whole time even though they have access to their phones during the entire day, but they can see their friends whenever they want to. They forget about real life, the people who love them, who want to spend more time with them. The way that they don't give attention affects their surroundings, like they start to feel more lonely because they are not having the chance to talk to them. I know it's true that social media helps us to feel more close to the people who are far from us, but because of that, we forget our surroundings. According to Maggie Fox and Erica Edwards, teenagers spend nine hours per day on screen. This shows how they don't do other activities and they waste their time on social media. Most of these people don't even study. In my opinion, nine hours a day, it's too much. In this kind of case, the parents 
are the most affected because all they want is for their children to go out to take a fresh air. We all know a parent who tells his daughter or his son to go out to do other things, but unfortunately, they don't because all they want is to be on their cell phones and social networks. Life is too short. We have to enjoy every moment of it and not just be on social media. Therefore, we have to put a limit of us being on it because it's really important and it is a waste of time. We have to find other stuff to do instead of us being online nine hours a day. There's a lot of ways to avoid this problem. First of all, they have to limit the amount of time they spend on it. Instead of them texting with their friends, they have to collaborate with each other to hang out, to spend more time together. The problem is that people who spend a lot of time on social media, they are sitting and not moving. So they can do other activities outside, such as sports. Also, they can spend more quality time with their family. If they do these things, it'll be two or three hours per day instead of nine. Since they will move more, they will lose some calories, they will be in better shape because their physical health will get better. Since they will spend more quality, quality time with their family and friends, they will feel less lonely, depressed, and maybe bored because their mental health will get better too. To sum up everything I said, social media has a good side, but at the same time is ruining our life and taking a lot of time for it. We are not being able to enjoy our life with our family and friends. To resolve this problem, we have to make some good memories with the people we love and support us. Thank you. When thinking about inspiration, it is also important to look at our past to get to the future. Secondary three students, Melissa Jabran, Mikhail Manukcharyan, Lori Oltasi, and Arani Pilibosyan took a look at where Surpagov started and where it might be in 300 years. Did you know that Surpagov uh, was originally a Saturday school and it opened in 1959? Later, in 1974, uh, it opened its first kindergarten and first grade class uh, with 37 students in total. Vanuhi Isajarnyan was the first principal and uh, this allowed Armenian students in Montreal uh, to learn about their language, their culture, and their heritage. As the years went on and more students started attending Supago, they were able to make the K-12 classes that we know today. Then, to accommodate all those new students, they moved into this building that we're still in. Um, obviously, as year progressed, technology advanced, and Supago was able to get more donations. So they used those donations to get better technology and more tools for the students here to understand and process information better. That's what the past of Supergulf looked like. What would the future look like? In 300 years, elevators will be incorporated into the school to help disabled people get in and out one more easy and more quickly. There will be smart boards and AIs as a visual aid for students, and AIs can, for example, run diagnostics on experiments we do in laboratories. Robot dogs will be available for students who need more time to de-stress and to relieve their emotions during exams to help them get better grades. Vending machines will be incorporated in our school for students to buy electronics or school supplies in case they need them or lose them. When teachers give out lectures, they'll be recorded and mimicked by robots to help students learn and re understand the subject better. There will be holograms as another visual aid for students and teachers can use them to explain what they are doing in more detail. Lastly, there will be floating desks and floating chairs to be more easy to transport during exam days when we bring the chairs to the gym. That's what we think will happen in Surpago in 300 years. What do you think? Our following speaker is Irma Asrabian from Secondary 5A with the topic of animal cruelty. 
Hello, today I would like to make a brief introduction about who I am and what I'll be talking about today. My name is Irma Asrabian, a secondary five student. For this year's competition, uh, the, the subject that I chose is compelling. And above all, it's about society's responsibility towards a big concern known as animal rights. Since childhood, I was always fascinated by all sorts of animals, their behavior and their relation to nature. As for the competition, my main goal isn't about winning or losing. Of course, the final result will justify the outcome of the competition. Yet, my main objective is to get the attention of the audience during my airtime. In our world, animal cruelty is still present, believe it or not. It is therefore important to act now before it's too late. Animal abuse is not at an alarming rate. If this phenomenon continues, it will lead to the endangerment of many species, as well as with their extinction. For example, did you know that more than 100 million animals die every year from abuse? To preserve the biodiversity and to protect their rights, we need to make sure to stand up for them at this very moment. Another example that proves my point is the situation of the donkey population. There is a theory on the internet that in the next five years, half of them could actually um, disappear from our planet because there is a certain company that is using their skin for their products. Isn't it awful? Animal abuse can take place in many forms. It can happen in laboratories where companies test their products on them, at home where some owners mistreat their pets, and in farms in which they give the animals antibiotics in order to accelerate their growth, to slaughter them afterwards so that they could supply the market with its needs. As I said before, in these laboratories, they actually test the animals with their products to make sure if it's safe for the humans to use. By doing so, it actually leads them to suffer, even though they did nothing wrong. In some extreme cases, certain species will be completely wiped out of our planet. If this happens, the biodiversity will eventually change. Animals like bears, tigers, elephants would sadly go extinct. In my opinion, fighting for animal rights is a genuine cause. We cannot be ignorant about it. As we all should know, there are certain species that cannot defend themselves against cruel people that are present in our society nowadays. That is why we need to make, we, we need to make sure to stand up for them. The action that is required today for the audience is to boycott all products that aren't cruelty free. Big companies like Giorgio Armani, Balenciaga, Chanel, Dior, Pantene, Gillette, etc. have been known to have products that have been cruel on, on animals. So, as a first step, you should stop buying these products. As a second step, I would suggest all of you to start encouraging or investing in companies that are actually trying to find a better alternative for such painful practices. For example, the other day, I was reading an interesting article which actually suggested that we use 3D printing and tissue growth technology as a substitute for such painful practices. And isn't it amazing? As a third step, we should pressure the government into adopting further legislation towards this issue that frankly nobody is even talking about these days. One good example that proves my point is the development of synthetic fur. As you can see, there is no need to kill a bear in order to get its fur because we already have it artificially made. As a result, lives can be saved. Of course, there will be skepticism that it won't be possible to do so. However, we have to pour our hopes into the future of science and engineering that one day we can control the mortality rate. We need to better educate ourselves towards this issue. I would like to see these changes take place during the next couple of years and to end this ongoing violence. In case society fails to practice the humane approach towards domestic, wildlife, and livestock animals, then this would lead to unnecessary deaths that could have been prevented. In some extreme cases, certain species will be completely wiped out of our planet because of the practice of animals slaughtering for products and torturing for entertainment. Finally, I would like to remind all of you to stop buying products that have been cruel on animals. If we do this, we could actually control the mortality rate. This would lead one step forward towards living in a better world that is only described in fiction.
Thank you. The next speaker is Ali Kagopian from Secondary 5B with the topic of gender norms. Hi, my name is Ali Kagopian. I'm a Secondary 5 student. Um, in my speech, I decided to talk about feminism and gender inequality because many people believe that full gender equality has been achieved, but um, in reality, it's still a current issue. I'm very excited to, to participate in this competition because it is giving me the chance to share what I believe in with other people. Feminists want women to be more powerful and superior than men. This is what most people think when they hear the term feminist. As Gloria Steinem once said, a feminist is anyone who recognizes the equality and full humanity of women and men. Today, I'm here to tell you that gender, full gender equality has not been achieved yet. Yes, over the past century, great accomplishments like women's right to vote and access to education have been made to defeat gender inequality and work toward a more equal society. But a great deal of work remains to be done all across the world. Our society still needs a feminism movement because of gender norms, violence against women, and lack of bodily autonomy. Gender norms are expectations and standards of behavior that are created by our own society for each gender. These gender norms are usually considered the only acceptable and desir desirable way of behaving. They determine the way people should act, dress, speak, and think. For example, when women are expected to be polite, submissive, nurturing, emotional, etc. As for men, they are required to be strong, aggressive, powerful, bold, and so on. These gender norms affect our society negatively because they disadvantage women and girls. They portray them as simply caretakers and allow only men to be in dominant positions. Plus, it is also limiting people from, being, from expressing themselves the way they want to. If a boy wants to wear makeup, he cannot do so without being called gay or not a real man. Violence against women is still something that happens on a daily basis. Were you aware that according to World Health Organization, one in three women will face some type of violence during their lifetime? That is over one billion women. That is a crazy number and should not be tolerated. These acts are caused by uh, gender inequality, like unequal powers and rigid gender no norms, which give women a lower social status. If a, if a um, woman comes forward and talks about being raped, they are oftentimes blamed. They are asked questions like, well, what were you wearing? Or were you uh, drinking any alcohol? This is called victim blaming. No one should be held responsible for the perpetrator's behavior other than the perpetrator. All this said does not mean that men do not face any type of violence. In fact, they do, but but society view, but they are less likely to speak up about it because society views it as a sign of weakness. When a rape male victim comes forward, they are usually told that they weren't raped or that they should have enjoyed it. This is unacceptable. Vi violence is violation of basic human rights and should not be tolerated nor justified under any circumstances. Let's not forget talk of, talk about the lack of bodily autonomy of women. Abortion is still a very controversial topic, and to be honest, it shouldn't be. It is the woman's body, and at, at the end of the day, it should be her choice. Now take Poland, for example. They are trying to ban abortion almost completely. It is only legal in certain situations like rape, incest, or when the mother's life is in danger. This is not, stop, this is not stopping abortions. It is only leading to unsafe abortions is also showing society that they can make the choice for a woman. Moreover, according to BBC, these, these um, 33,000 girls become child brides per day. Become, they become child brides per day. Child marriage has a devastating impact on those girls. They are usually robbed of their childhood, they, are, um, they face a much higher risk of having health complications and uh, facing abuse, and they're also prevented from getting an education. Th this, which is, this is also a reason why women are not in dominant positions in the workplaces. A world without gender inequality is a world where every single woman can live their life without the fear of being harassed. It is a world where no man is afraid to express their emotions. It is a world where every single person no matter their gender, have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else. Gender inequality is an urgent problem, and that is why feminism is still needed in our society. 
uh, this is not only a woman's issue, it is also a man's issue. It is something that we as society need to come together to defeat. So, thank you. Inspiration isn't enough if society is not aware of the issues that we are faced with every day. Recently, the entire secondary four class collaborated to put on events in the first ever mental health a -thon. Let's look at what they did. Do you tend to spend the majority of your time on your phone? Well, do not fear. That's why Break Up With Your Tech is here. Our team has created a campaign to help you detach from your electronic devices. We're here to give you tips and tricks on how to, in fact, break up with your tech. We hope we can help you reduce your screen time. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us on Instagram. Well, what are you waiting for? Follow our social media accounts to be up to date with our campaign. Back in February, we started a project to motivate social media users. You could have found us at... society, beauty standards are very high and unrealistic. Because of that, a lot of us have felt insecure about our body and the way we look. If you go on Instagram and type body.positivity.awareness, you can find the account that my team and I have created, where we talk about the different kinds of insecurities and how we think you can overcome yours. Our Instagram page would be helpful with some quotes and devices. If not, you can always ask someone for help. Hey guys, I'm Tamar Khashkashan. Hello, I'm Harak Khaji. Hi, I'm Maya Daftian. We're raising awareness for a better and healthier life. Healthy relationships and friendships, toxic ones. In order to do this, we've decided to post on many social media platforms. Such as Snapchat and Instagram. We give out advice, answer questions, and help people see if they're in a toxic relationship or friendship. It can all be confidential. We post on a daily basis to keep our campaign active and going. A healthy life starts with healthy relationships. Hi, our team is named Anytime Anywhere. I'm Nara Zorabian. I'm Vani Tokatlian. And I'm Gorim Murabian. Our campaign is to provide comfort and positivity to people going through family problems. Our main presence was seen through our social media platforms, such as our Instagram account and our Twitter account. We also made posters to promote our social media platforms. Families aren't always easy. But we're here to help. Anytime, anywhere. Hi everyone, uh, so we're from the Sec4B class. Uh, so today we're going to present you uh, our depression campaign. Okay, so in English class with Mr. Lu, we made a project for awareness campaigns and we chose the subject of depression so that we could help uh, people who are uh, suffering for depression or mental issues. So we have an Instagram page, make sure you follow us. Um, we post daily posts, uh, facts, questions, uh, make sure you interact so we get an idea of what to post what to what to post in the future uh, and we have a qr code which leads to our website uh, and on the website we got quizzes uh, facts articles and much more.
The next speaker is Vima Karshafjian from Secondary 5A with the topic of medicine. Hi, I'm Rima Kharshafjian. When I first heard about the public speaking competition, I started thinking about what inspires me and I realized that there's a lot, but what really stands out is cardiology. Ever since I was a child, I've always been interested in how the human body works, especially the heart. I'm very excited to participate in the competition because I enjoy speaking in front of an audience. I love engaging in conversations and I feel like the persuasive speech is a great way to express yourself and influence others. To beat or not to beat. This is a phrase that can be interpreted in many ways. Let us take the human heart, for example. It is an organ located at the center of our body. Without it, blood will not be pumped into our system and we shall die. Imagine how important it is for our life. We must protect it, keep it healthy, and treasure it. However, despite everything that a person may do to keep their heart in good condition, cardiovascular diseases can still meddle with their health. Adopting a healthy lifestyle contributes a lot in one's good health, and so do all the research made by doctors as well as scientists. In Canada, cardiovascular diseases are very common. They affect the people around us, our friends, our family, and even you. Loss of a loved one is very painful. There are many cardiovascular diseases that doctors know too little about. Research on these kinds of diseases is needed to prevent them, improve patient care, and reduce deaths. Cardiology is a field that inspires me and needs a lot of attention. Before we begin, I would like to draw your attention to two technical words. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular heartbeat. Ablation is a surgical procedure where they use burns or freezes to scar certain parts inside the heart. Surgeons do this to stop the electric signals that cause the irregular heartbeat. Medicine is a diverse and vast field that has many meticulous professions. According to statistics, there is a lack of cardiologists. In an article entitled, Too Many Patients, Too Few Cardiologists to Care by Dr. Ross and Associates, Cardiologists on average work 57 hours a week, more than the average of 52 hours for all other specialists. In 2003, 29% of all cardiologists were 55 years of age and older, compared to only 22% in 2001. As time goes by, more and more cardiologists retire, leaving fewer specialists in practice as not many doctors specialize in cardiology. One of the major repercussions of this trend is that medicine does not progress as it should. Since my childhood, I have heard a lot about heart failure from which my two grandparents died. I was sad that I did not get to know them. Being heartbroken and sorrowful, I decided that I wanted to become a doctor. As you can guess, a cardiologist to save lives. I remember when I went to the science center with my school, the guide explained to us what a heartbeat is and he let us hear three different types of heartbeats. I was fascinated with that. During science classes in secondary three, my favorite chapter was biology, and I enjoyed the experience of the heart dissection. I got interested in cardiovascular disease research and realized the importance of research impact assessment. Thanks to research and new technology, there has been an increase in the survival of the people affected by coronary heart disease, which is the most widespread disease. I have learned that there is much more to research than we think. Apart from medical impacts, it gives hope to suffering patients and improves their morale. Society's encouragement and support are a significant part of scientific breakthrough. The majority of people choose not to go into specialties in medicine because the requirements are way too high and there are a lot of lawsuits. As you see, they don't have society's encouragement and support. By raising awareness, donating, encouraging research, or even choosing to go into that field, you can contribute to many achievements that will save lives. Let me give you the simplest example. Some of you may know that if you want to donate for breast cancer research, you can buy daffodils. For cardiology, during a specific, specific week in February, 
you can buy apples and the money will directly go to the Cardiology Institute of Montreal. Easy peasy, right? In an article titled The Social Impact of Cardiology Research Beyond Management by Paula Adam and Associates, cardiovascular research has been a highly effective investment as it resulted in better health and care for the patients. It was also an encouraging message for politicians to invest and for researchers to keep doing their job. Without encouragement and support, nothing would have happened. When each and every person contributes in their own way, there will be many more breakthroughs and medicine will advance. For example, hundreds and thousands of people live with a hidden heart rhythm disorder called atrial fibrillation. Professor Paulus Kirchhoff did a clinical trial called East Afnet 4, where he discovered that antiarrhythmic drugs, or a procedure called ablation, do break the abnormal impulses of the heart and reduce complications such as heart attacks and strokes. Thanks to heart transplants, patients who would normally have zero chances of survival are now able to live. Statistics show that the survival rate after a heart transplant is more than 85% after one year. Isn't that simply extraordinary? Inspired by all of the achievements and the unknowns that have yet to be discovered, I'm going to go into medicine and make my contribution to saving lives, as I do, no, do not want other children to lose their loved ones the way I did. Thank you. Our next speaker is Martin Yeremian from Secondary 5B with the topic of parents. Hey guys, my name is Martin Yeremian. I'm 18 years old and I'm from Armenia. The subject of my precious speech is parents, and I think it's pretty obvious how this how my subject is related to inspiration. And I feel good about this competition because it's been like three or four years that I speak English decently, and it's going to be interesting for me to compete with people who were born in Canada and whose native tongue basically is English. Thank you. Don't anger your parents in order to please other people. Those other people did not spend their lives building yours. Anonymous. Can you imagine living a life without having a parent by your side? The first time that I came to Canada, it was just me and my dad, since my mom stayed in Armenia with my brother. We brought some money with us, but it eventually ended. My dad didn't want to bother my mom by asking for money, so he found a job in a car wash. He was getting paid $7 per hour, and I, re I remember every time he got home, his face looked happy, because he was taking care of me, but in reality, I knew that he was exhausted. Listening to my speech is important because we all need to rely because we all should understand the value of our parents. Most of us put our most of us put our parents in bad situations without even understanding how much we hurt them. Today, I would like to talk about how the people of our age, basically our generation, thinks that they don't need their parents in the future, even though they see how much sacrifices they go through just to make them happy. We all need to realize that even though in the future we are going to be able to take care of ourselves, we should we always should keep our parents by our side. When the first time we work somewhere and we earn our own money, we think that we can live happily without our parents because we are basically capable of taking care of ourselves. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, we are in a house alone with no moral support. At that time, we understand that the objects that we can get from stores cannot replace our parents. Those people are there for us no matter what. Even if the entire world is against us, they are going to be in our side. Our parents will do anything possible so we can live under a roof. They are never shy about their jobs and it doesn't matter what kind of a job it is. Leonardo DiCaprio's mom, Irmelin, is often seen as her son's date of film premieres and award shows. And they are very close. And the ones Leonardo said, I wouldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't for her, both my parents. She supported this little kid who said, I want to be an actor at 12 years old, which is ridiculous. And she drove me to all these auditions. She's the only reason I'm able to do what I do. Life is too short. We have to spend our time on appreciating our parents for what they have done 
and for what they are doing for us. We all know that eventually we are going to lose them. So it is very important to understand the value of our parents and start giving them, a, them the affection that they absolutely deserve. Uh, everybody should spend time on thinking how to make our relationships with our parents even better. I wish that every one of us gives at least the half of the affection that our parents have given us since we were born. For example, when they get, when they get us something and it doesn't matter if the thing is expensive or cheap, we should always let them know that whatever they do for us is appreciated and we are very thankful. Uh, when we start spending our time on thinking how to make our relationship, relationship, relationships with our parents better, we will eventually find the ways. Instead of wasting our time on unnecessary things su such as social media, we can just go and talk to them because sooner or later they are going to leave us. Uh, 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 <laughs> because sooner or later they are going to leave us. Uh, we must make them feel appreciated after every little thing they do for us. When I was younger, I was a very greedy, greedy person. I used to think that my parents weren't doing the best for me, but the one day I understood that I was totally wrong. I started giving, I started appreciating every little thing they did for me. And since, that, since then, my relationship with them became very good. I'm sure everyone in, me, in my class loves making people feel appreciated, loved, loved and happy. Imagine seeing your dad, dad come back home after a long day with a smile on his face. Imagine seeing your mom smiling while she, while she is washing the dishes. Imagine you found out that the reason of those smiles is you. I'm sure at the end of the day, they would give back us the, uh, uh, the affection that we gave them during the day. And finally, guys, I want you to become more serious about this subject. I promise there is nothing more, more important in this world than making your parents happy and proud of you. Love them with all your heart and try not to hurt them ever. Thank you. This year's competition wouldn't be possible without the collaboration of so many people. Most notably, Sarin Sabunjan, who without hesitation volunteered to help us film. Also, we want to thank the SHTV team, who helped edit this all together. So let's take a moment to see what SHTV is all about for those of you who haven't seen the first two episodes yet.
following speaker is Sergi Aharonian from Secondary 5A, and her topic is gymnastics. Hello, my name is Sergi Aharonian. I'm one of the finalists of public speaking competition. My speech is about gymnastics. I chose this topic because it's something that inspires me a lot. I have been doing gymnastics since I was four years old. Whenever I practice this amazing sport, I feel better and happier. I want to convince others to practice gymnastics because it has a lot of benefits. It helps you to stay mentally and physically healthy. I'm very excited about the competition because I love speaking in front of an audience. Everyone will just concentrate and listen on what you're saying. Basically, they will see everything from your point of view. So I cannot wait till competition day. One day, when I was a kid, my father took me to a gym center. He opened the door, looked at me and said, good luck. I was very confused and didn't know this place. After a few seconds, the coach walked towards me. I looked at her and asked, where am I? Her name was Lucine. She smiled and told me that I came to a whole new world. Around me, there were a bunch of girls who were flipping, jumping, practicing flexibility. I remember my heart starting to beat faster and wanting to be like those girls. That day, I understood that I found the sport of my life. It was called gymnastics. This physical activity inspires me a lot because it totally changed my life. It helped me to always be positive and never give up. Gymnastics has two different types, one for the boys and the other for the girls. It doesn't require a specific age. Anyone can participate at any time. I think that it would be a good experience for everyone to think about becoming a gymnast because it has useful results. One can be strong and happy. Gymnastics is one of the best exercises for training overall health and wellness. Multiple studies show that it is very helpful for your bones and muscles. Due to a lot of factors, including age, bones start to get thinner, lose most of their nutrients, which causes a lot of health problems, such as osteoporosis, bonelessness, and bone fractures. If you want to accelerate bone mineral density and straighten your bones, then practicing flexibility can be a good option. In the article named 11 Health Benefits of Gymnastics According to Science, there's a study which shows that it improves bone geometry and resistance in girls. This research analyzed girls who were doing intensive gymnastics training exercises and found out that it has increased bone thickness plus volumetric bone density. Let's also talk about control. Acrobatics ameliorates balance, which is very helpful, especially for the kids. At a young age, infants always try to climb trees, but they end up falling and getting injured. If a child practices this amazing sport, then they can learn how to control themselves, which is the solution of not getting hurt. It's not only about body health, but also mental. This type of training helps you to get rid of stress and sadness. In the same article that I mentioned, there's an analysis that shows gymnastics, which is a physical exercise, has an impact on the brain. It reduces signs of depression plus endorphin abstinence, which is the cause of fatigue and irritability. Also by practicing more, one can see that they're capable of doing everything so their confidence level will go up. This can help everyone to learn about not giving up. Plus, by learning new skills, you will start to be happier and try even harder to move forward. These are the two special reasons why this workout can help someone to have a better life by being physically and mentally healthy. Now we know that this sport has benefits. 
But there's a lot of people who think that this training isn't good for kids. Arriving at the gymnastics Olympics level takes a lot of hard work. Some adolescents have to practice 30 hours per week for years to arrive at that degree. For this reason, our society thinks that those teenagers are only losing their time over some useless activity and don't have a bright future. There's huge amount of young girls and boys who dream about becoming a competitive gymnast, but their parents force them to stop what they're doing because they think that it's not a normal job. Instead, they obligate them to become a doctor or a lawyer, which the kids don't dream about. In consequence, from earlier, they stop to achieve their goals. What I want from everyone is to know that becoming a competitive gymnast is a normal job. Everyone has to encourage the young people to continue to dream about their favorite sport and not about another job. Also, you can motivate the kids by explaining to them that it is normal to be injured because becoming an athlete takes time. Even if you get hurt, you will stand up again and be even stronger. We learn from our mistakes how to be more powerful. If everyone does so, then more teens will be able to accomplish their goals, do what they like, and not what their parents or the society forces them to become. They will be happier, develop a good mental health, and work harder to arrive at their dream future. To finish my speech, gymnastics helps our body and mind. So we should encourage more people to try this sport and motivate the kids to continue to train every week in order to become the best athletes in the world. Thank you. The following speaker is Pali Kamalian from Secondary 5B with the topic of plastic surgery. Hey, it's Pali Kamalian, and my speech is about plastic surgeries. I chose this topic because a lot of people in the world are against these procedures, and I'm here to convince them otherwise. I'm very happy to participate in this competition and can't wait for my speech. The end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century are remarkable regarding how beauty standards have supposedly become obligatory in the world especially in the Western countries. Did you know that in 2018, more than 17.7 million cosmetic procedures were performed in the United States, a number that has risen steadily over the past five years? If we take a look at the commercials on the television and the internet, most of them are related to beauty. All kinds of cosmetics, clothes, gyms, fitness programs, and plastic surgeries are advertised everywhere. In spite of the fact that the role of beauty in the modern world can be arguable, and even though many are against the use of aesthetic surgery, there are still a lot of reasons why I think changing one's appearance should be regarded and considered normal by everyone in our society. First of all, plastic surgery must be acceptable because it can restore self-confidence, which is probably one of the most important advantages a person can gain from this kind of procedures. Despite common opinion, A wish to surgically correct someone's face or body may not necessarily be explained as dysmorphophobia, which is a psychological disorder characterized by fear that one's body or any part of it is repulsive. But this decision can be a rational and conscious one. Some people have physical features that have a noticeable impact on their daily lives, such as a cleft lip, skull deformation, and excessive pigmentation. They tend to perceive such traits as undesirable and unpleasant. And this fact can negatively affect communication, social interactions, furthermore causing insecurity and depression in them. In these cases, plastic surgery not only helps to remove undesired disturbances, but also boosts self-confidence and self-esteem, as well as granting that person the ability to live a normal life. Even studies have proven that 93% of cosmetic treatment patients were satisfied with the outcome and felt better about themselves after their surgery. 
Second of all, plastic surgeries can be undergone due to medical reasons. One of the most common surgeries is a lift in the eye and around the forehead. This helps to reduce eye pain and headaches caused by physiological defects. Another example is a damage received as a result of an accident, a chemical or thermal burn, deep scars, fractures, malformations, and so on. In these situations, reconstructive surgeries can be used to return a patient back to their original appearance before the incident. According to Cleveland Clinic, nearly 1 million reconstructive surgeries are performed each year. Third of all, there are cases where plastic surgeries can improve a person's overall health condition. This is a common effect for people whose eyelids feel heavy. They start to notice their peripheral vision is blocked by baggy eyelids and feel exhausted more than they usually do. Others remark their eyes becoming strained and tired when they read or drive. So these people often tend to undergo upper eyelid surgery, which ameliorates vision by removing the excess skin and tissue that weighs down the upper eyelid. This treatment reduces eye pain and ameliorates vision, and its results are nearly immediate. In conclusion, undergoing a surgery that is related to someone's face or body is usually seen as shameful, and many of its opponents look only at the negative consequences such operations have. However, they also have so many positive effects, which in some cases overlap potential harms. In particular, plastic surgery can raise self-confidence and self-esteem. It can save a person from health damages caused by physiological defects, as well as fix the results of different kinds of accidents. Moreover, these surgeries can be beneficial for health in general. All these facts prove that plastic surgery must be tolerated by every single one of us. Thank you. Now that all of the 12 speeches are done, we would like to, as tradition, invite our principal, Ms. Lori Abrakian, to say a few words to close the, this year's competition. I would like to congratulate all of the participants, whether they be finalists or not. Uh, it is a very difficult task to speak publicly, I can attest to it. And if you've watched the first episode of SHTV, you'll know that I don't particularly enjoy it either. That being said, it is a skill that you need for life. And in honor of William Saroyan, I think it is very uh, important for all of our students, whether they were part of the fi finalists who presented or not, uh, it's very important to use your voice for matters that are important to you. So congratulations. I don't even know who the winner is yet. Even I'm uh, being kept uh, in the dark, but congratulations. And I just want to say a huge shout out to Mr. Lou um, for finding a way to make this program or project come to life even despite the COVID measures. Also a huge thanks to our host um, Vane and to Miss Sarin behind the camera uh, for allowing all of this project to come to life. So thank you, congratulations and looking forward to it, the next one already. Thank you Miss Abrakian. It is now time for the secondary four students to go cast their votes on classroom. Make sure to follow the instructions given and let's hope the best speech wins. The results for the public speaking competition will be shown on the next episode of SHTV this Saturday on YouTube, so tune in. We would like to thank you for watching this year's public speaking competition. We sincerely hope to see all of you in person at next year's competition in 2022. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.